Welcome to the Movement Upgraded Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jen Hostler, licensed physical therapist and certified strength and mobility coach. Here you can expect to hear about all things movement. The Movement Upgraded Podcast is a blend of the science of strength training, rehab, and mobility mixed with the personal and professional experience to provide you with the steps you need to keep your body pain-free and moving well so you can do what you love forever. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the podcast. We're going to talk about protein today. So this was a highly requested episode. I talk a little bit about protein on um, Instagram here and there, but I definitely talk about it to almost everybody that I work with um, because to this day, I don't think there are very many people that I have worked with in my office um, or virtually who are actually getting the recommended amount of protein um, that they need, especially if we are active women um, or active people in general. So I'm going to talk today about one, why protein is so important and why I bring it up um, in my client sessions very often, why it's something that I screen for. Um, two, we're going to talk about what happens when you're not getting enough and what that looks like, um, how much you actually need. Um, we're going to talk about some signs that you might not be getting enough. And then I'm going to talk about practicality, some steps in getting enough protein. I am definitely going to say that I am not a registered dietitian by any means. So I often will talk to my clients about this and Sometimes they can just kind of make those changes and, and are aware enough that they can adjust. But if you are somebody listening to this, um, I will kind of point out a couple of areas that may indicate you might want to hire a coach who has the knowledge and the expertise to coach you through this. I could do that. Um, I've learned a lot about nutrition. I just choose not to because it's not something that I do on a regular basis and I like to focus on what I'm good at and what I enjoy, which is movement. So I very often refer my clients to people who do work on the nutrition side. And so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit, but most of the podcast is going to be covering why it's so important, especially from my perspective as a physical therapist and strength coach. And then also just some signs on whether or not you might not be getting enough protein. And I'm also going to bring up a few ways that you can get more protein. I'm going to share some of my personal experience um, and we'll kind of unpack that a little bit as well. So without further ado, let's talk about why protein is so important. So the main reason that protein is so important is protein is the building block for a lot of the different things in our bodies. Specifically, it's the building block for our protein, um, sorry, our protein, our muscles and our tendons and ligaments and everything that our body creates, even our hormones. So when we don't have enough protein, we are going to have problems with our health. And there is a term now that changed. It was called the female athlete triad. Um, back when I was first learning uh, exercise science several years ago, probably was that over a decade now, um, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I am 30 and now reaching the older generation. (laughs) It's really weird. But back when I was learning, it was called the female athlete triad. And we have now changed that to call, um, to be called red S. So R E D S relative energy deficiency in sport. And that is because it is not just women that deal with this. It is also men. Um, and it's more encompassing than just what the female athlete triad was. So relative energy deficiency in sport really just means, um, the multifactorial health and performance consequences of low energy availability or not eating enough essentially. And part of this is just not eating enough fuel. Um, calorie wise, it can also mean not eating enough carbs and it can also mean not eating enough fat and it can also mean not eating enough protein. Those are the main macronutrients. I'm not going to cover all of them, but I wanted to talk specifically about protein because protein really is, um, what fuels our body with the ability to repair the quote unquote damage that we make, um, or that we create from exercise. Exercise is a stressor on our bodies. 
Um, the way that our bodies work, and I talked about this a little bit at the one of the first couple episodes, is that we get better when we are stressed. Um, stress for our bodies is good for our bodies. When we experience not enough stress, we actually start to decline in our health and overall like strength, all of those things. So we need stressors to at least maintain um, and a little bit more to actually progress or um, build strength or get better, better cardiorespiratory fitness. And when we are stressing our bodies, um, we are not making the changes there. It is when we are resting after um, that we are actually making the change of a stronger muscle or um, the adaptations of cardiorespiratory fitness, which I'm not going to get into. When we make those adaptations, that is only going to happen if we have the ingredients that we need to make said adaptations. And one of those ingredients for a lot of the things is protein. If we are constantly stressing our tissues, our muscles, our ligaments, our tendons, our bodies, and we are not giving our bodies the fuel it needs to combat those stresses and build a stronger body, essentially, um, we are then going to run the risk of too much breakdown and not enough building up. And that can put us at risk for an impaired metabolic rate, hormonal disrupt disruptions. Our menstrual cycle can start to become problematic, irregular, erratic, and even we can lose it, which is a really not a great sign. So if you are listening to this that and you're like, oh no, I you know, I haven't had my period for several months or it's very irregular, that is definitely a sign that you want to seek out a healthcare provider and discuss that because um, if you haven't been eating enough and you definitely have some menstrual cycle dysfunction, um, that is what we would call like a red flag. Like it's something that you want to get addressed very quickly. Our menstrual cycles are a very good um, little like uh, people, that's not even the right word, but like uh, window is the word that I would use into our health as women. And if you're on birth control, obviously this is a little different, but um, if you are not and you have a regular cycle and you notice some changes, it's a good indicator that something's going on with your health. Um, other things that can happen, we can have reduced bone health. So our bone density or how strong our bones are, they can start to become weaker and we have an increased risk for things like stress fractures. Um, also our immune system. Um, this is something I'll talk about next, but a lot of people who are sick all the time are just not eating enough protein um, specifically, or they're just not eating enough, but protein's a high, like really common one. Um, we can have impaired protein synthesis. So instead of, you know, being able to create protein and generate the muscle tissue, for example, we're just not going to have the benefit or the ingredients for that. Um, and also cardiovascular health can decline as a byproduct of, of relative energy deficiency um, problems. Um, so the things that this kind of looks like and how it impacts our lives are going to be your increased risk for stress fractures. You're more likely to get injured in general. You're going to have poor recovery from lifting, which means means delayed progress. So um, a lot of people plateau or they just don't feel like they're making progress in the gym. Um, there is actually some research for an increased pain risk, especially chronic pain, um, where there is a little bit of research that shows a lower threshold for pain, um, which means it's like the same amount of load for people with a lower threshold would feel pain versus somebody with a higher threshold, it takes more for them to feel pain. Um, and our pain thresholds are adjusted like on a day-to-day -day basis. I've talked about this a little bit in the pain neuroscience um, podcast episode. I don't remember which one that was, but scroll back and check that out if you wanna learn about pain thresholds a little bit. Um, but in my own anecdotal like clinic, working with people, people who definitely have more chronic pain where they have this nagging thing, Going through and increasing their nutrition, um, specifically protein, actually helps them a ton. So there's a little bit of research to support it. I didn't do a super deep dive into the research, so I'm sharing my own personal experience, which is also important. Um, but that would make sense if we understand how pain is a perception of threat. So if we are in a state of feeling threatened or not safe, our body is likely going to lower our pain threshold and we're going to feel pain more often so um, or more easily. So not eating enough kind of signals the concept of scarcity, which means a lack of safety, right? That would make a lot of sense that we would have more pain. So 
sometimes um, we have to make sure we're increasing our protein intake and that's something, this is why I screen for this. In addition to a lack of progress because when I'm working with people, we are very often stressing tissues. We are inducing some inflammation. We are trying to build strength, adding a little bit of muscle. None of those things are going to be happen or they're going to be delayed if we are not fueling our bodies with the protein we need to make those changes and adaptations. Not to mention, if you just want to build muscle, like if you want to see muscle definition, you're going to have to build muscle. You have to give your body what it needs to make muscle. (laughs) It can't just create muscle out of nowhere. Um, Also, side note, our hair and nails, um, very often with people who start to increase their protein, they notice their nails are thicker um, and their hair is a lot less likely, less prone to breakage and a lot stronger. So if you're somebody who struggled with those things, yeah, genetics play um, a little bit of a risk, but definitely if you're under eating protein, you're just not giving your body a chance to have strong hair and nails. Um, So those are things. Other signs that you're not eating enough. So that's kind of like why it's why it's important. That's what it puts us at risk for. Um, and, And the main reason that I bring this up again comes down to two things. One, more pain and a higher risk for injury and two, a lack of progress. Um, And three, really overall health, like all of those things that protein matters for. Um, And if people are coming to me with a certain goal, um, I'm going to make sure we're tackling all the things that make sure you can achieve said goal. Um, So we cover things like sleep and I cover things like stress management with clients and we refer out when needed. Um, But nutrition is one of those things we screen for as well. So let's go on to a couple more signs that you might not be eating enough protein. One is going to be if you're hungry a lot. Um, A lot of people I work with are like, I just, I snack so much. And they'll talk about, hey, like, I feel like I need to snack a lot. Like, but I, maybe their goal is like fat loss or something along those lines. And um, a lot of the time, we don't need to really worry about reducing the snacking because most of my clients, once they start eating enough protein, they realize they're full and they don't, they're not looking for snacks. Um, And if they are looking for a snack, they realize it's because they haven't hit their protein for that day. So that's really helpful in knowing that because that, um, and a lot of people don't necessarily believe it until they experience it, but that's super common. So if you're hungry a lot or you feel like you need to snack all the time, it's your body saying, I need nutrients. (laughs) Like there's a reason that happens. Um, If you're sick a lot, I was chronically sick growing up for a multitude of reasons, Um, partial constant stress, a little anxiety and partially poor sleep, but a big part of it also was I was, I never ate enough protein. I hated most meat. I didn't, I I like it. it, My um, journey with eating has been very complex, but I did not feel myself enough. So I was always sick as a kid all through high school in PT school. And my first year out of PT school, when I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, super stressed, just a ball of stress constantly. Um, I got really, really sick for uh, like a month. And I have what I would call mono. I didn't go to the doctor because my symptoms were like not enough that they could really do anything. Um, But I had like a 99 degree fever for every day for like 20 some odd straight days um, and a headache. And um, I had low energy. It was awful. And I just wasn't eating. I was not fueling myself that year. Um, That was like one of the worst years for myself feeding um, because my appetite went down because of stress, which we're going to talk about. But getting sick a lot is a very high, like good likelihood um, that you're not eating enough protein. If your sleep is sucking, like if your quality of sleep isn't that great, um, you might not be eating enough in general, um, but especially protein. If you get injured a lot, if you have like this chronic nagging thing, check your protein intake. Um, If you're not progressing in the gym, we talked about that a little bit. If you've plateaued, if you're just feeling low motivation to get into the gym um, for whatever reason, like you're just like, I don't want to go. You might just not have the energy because you're not fueling yourself. That happened to me and has happened multiple times. Um, Feeling tired all the time. This is huge feeling tired all the time. And a lot of people will be like, well, I just know it's because I don't sleep well. Well, why are you not sleeping well? It might not, it might just because you're not eating enough and protein's part of it. Um, enough carbs is also part of it, but I'm not getting into that today. And then uh, we talked about this already, but irregular cycle or losing your cycle altogether can be a sign that you need to talk to a healthcare provider about this specifically. That's one of those red flags that you need to get taken care of more often than not, but the rest just might mean that you need to increase your protein intake. So how much protein do we really need. 
I'm going to link an article if you want to double check on this and read more about it. But, um, and I believe the article is from the International Society of Sports and Nutrition, ISSN. Um, they put out a really great article just kind of like summarizing a lot of the evidence when it comes to protein intake. But their overall recommendation after um, kind of looking at all of the evidence is 1.4 to 2 uh, 0.0 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. So obviously there's some conversion there. If you are in the United States, we don't use kilograms because we like to make up our own things to use. And, um, but that is a great place to kind of start to look at like what is recommended, right? The, this is different than the daily recommendation from, I want to say like the RDA, which is like really low. This is for people who are athletes, right? And I am not somebody who's like, I love the idea of calling myself an athlete just because of the connotation around athletes in my brain is very much, they sacrifice their bodies for a sport. Their performance is their number one goal. It's not necessarily health. And, um, I feel like, uh, people, other people can agree with that. Sometimes other people might not. What I want you to understand is when it comes to things like the article that I'm talking about and these recommendations, if you are an active person, you are probably considered an athlete. So it's important to understand that if you're an active person, your recommendations are not the same for somebody who is sedentary. Um, and we really need to understand that. So the general recommendations are like the bare minimum. And I think they're even looking, or if they have not already looked into or have completely increased the recommendation, it's increasing. So even a sedentary population probably should eat more than the, the bare minimum of what's recommended. There's some arguments about that right now. Um, but what I would say is it's not, um, from what I understand, super likely that you're going to overeat in protein. I think that is a big fear. A lot of people have, and I think it's pretty hard to do so. There's even some evidence that in the article that they talked about eating even as much as three grams of protein per kilogram of body weight a day, um, has positive effects on people who, um, might have more physique goals where they are trying to lose fat. Um, it really is important, especially if that's your goal, to make sure that you are eating a high amount of protein because you don't want to lose muscle. And if you are cutting your calories a bit, um, your body, if you are not paying attention, will get rid of your muscle because it's the most energetically um, demanding. So it, it costs a lot of like fuel for us to keep our muscle mass. And if you are not actively working on making sure you're eating enough protein and more than you might normally, um, your body will get rid of your muscle more so than your fat. And, um, if your goal is just pure, I just want to lose all the, all the weight. Um, then I guess that would be fine. I would, uh, most people are not going to recommend that because, muscle mass and muscle tissue is really beneficial for aging effects for a lot of other things. So, um, that's my little spiel about that. That is, um, I tend to err more towards recommending a higher amount of protein for the people that I work with just because they're more active. So you have to understand that and kind of learn that for yourself, but those are the recommendations. Um, and that is kind of the general gist. That's me just giving you what the article already says. Um, practicality is what we're going to get into next. So if you're somebody who's like, okay, well, I know I don't eat that much. Um, you're not going to be able to jump right into that much or your stomach's going to bother you. Your body's going to be like, what the heck's going on? You have to wean yourself into it. it. Knowing what's ideal is helpful, but you have to know where you start as well because you can't just jump into what's ideal. Um, so we need to make sure again, that's when sometimes having a coach is really helpful. They can help you, um, know how to titrate those things. Otherwise it's pretty simple. You just start to increase a little bit here and there and notice how your body feels. And, um, that way you don't get upset stomach issues and feel like you're just like stuffed all the time. That's very common. When people start to do this, they start to realize, um, wow, like I'm really full. And also I am not snacking anymore because I'm not hungry. So that's something, um, to keep in mind. The next thing I want to talk about when it comes to practicality is that it's not just like you, 
You can't just memorize somebody else's meal plan or how they eat and just implement it. So when I talk um, after at the end of this podcast about some of the things I've learned and kind of how I set my day up, um, this is not for you to mimic it. It's just for you to get some ideas. A lot of the way that I've done things is literally because I've either come up with it on my own or I've learned it from somebody else that I follow or have talked to or something along those lines. I think that can be really helpful, but I want you to remember that, um, the most important thing you can do is just learn where you are and kind of be able to self-reflect and look at those things and then manage those habits because this comes down like everything else, like taking care of your body to your habits and it's a skill. And if you are to just mimic somebody, copy them, do a meal plan, you are not learning the knowledge and the skill set of actually feeding yourself. You, which, which means life is dynamic. Our lives change all the time. The last few years have definitely showed us that. If you're not learning the skills of, of like why and how to kind of integrate those things, as soon as life throws you a curveball your routine's just gonna be thrown off and you're not gonna be able to make an adjustment, right? Um, And that in and of itself, the application, the flexibility, the adjustments, those are skills too, by the way. So um, it takes practice and experience to like navigate those skills. But if you're just trying to mimic the way somebody else eats, it's just not gonna be sustainable for you. Also, you probably don't like the same foods they do. Your body might not respond the same way as they do to those types of foods. I know stuff about my body that I have to kind of adjust based on how I respond. Food is very individual. Um, And also just like your appetite and like what you like is gonna be different. So it's really important to navigate and learn those skills. And this is where a coach can really um, be super handy because they may be able to point you in directions or point things out that you wouldn't have known. Um, And they can really facilitate some of that self-reflection. And that is really helpful. So, um, they can also just help give you some support because sometimes it's, it's difficult navigating those things. And, um, I think when a lot of people say that they want a lot of accountability, I think they really just want support. I think those, that's, um, something to think of. So, um, something I want to talk about when it comes to practicality too, is most often, um, if you're like questioning this, if you're thinking this might be you, you might need to track your food. Um, I know that some people have tendencies towards like perfectionism and it's really important to know that if you have a history of any sort of like eating disorder or anything like that, um, you may want, this is also a reason that you may want to be working with a professional because they can help you not kind of obsess and learn some of the other tools. Again, I don't do any of that. I'm just feeding you general information today so you can have it. Um, But tracking is really helpful in being able to know where you are and know how to adjust that. Um, It's never a forever tool. I have never tracked all of my food um, consistently. I just don't want to do that. I have an obsessive tendency to um, kind of get obsessed of numbers and that's just not something that I have the capacity for in my life at this point. Um, but I do track my protein here and there. And once you've kind of paid attention to it and you've looked at the macros and you've looked at how many, how much, many grams of protein you're having, and maybe you paid attention to your portion, portion sizes a little bit, you'll know what foods, um, you'll kind of have that memorized because you will realize that you eat pretty consistently the same foods. Now I'll backtrack a little bit and tell you going back to when we talked about habits, this is why it's important to understand that eating yourself is habits. I typically have like a general list of the same types of foods for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and my snacks that I know are my go-tos. Um, I get really tired of them and we cycle through things cause I get almost like a, an obsession with a food for a while and then I get absolutely tired of it. Um, but if you're somebody who's like, I have no rhyme or reason or approach to eating, like I don't really think of it. Um, you can obviously work on this. If you have the time, the space, the mental capacity to really work on this and start to pay attention, it's totally doable to DIY. But again, that might be another indicator that you need a coach. And if you're listening to this and you're like, cool, Jen, I keep hearing that I need a coach, basically. Um, please feel free to message me. I have a handful of people that I recommend. Um, I've had Steph Godro on the podcast um, in an episode, uh, several episodes back. She has several programs. I would recommend her programming. She's very smart. She does this a lot with people. Um, she educates a ton. So if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend looking into her programs and her 
even her free information, right? Um, so check her out, pay her for her knowledge. She's amazing. Um, but that is another sign that you may want to work with somebody if you have no habits or you don't think about meals in a certain way. Um, that's kind of where we, where I'd recommend if you're somebody like that, because if you don't have any approach and you're not, you don't have like a system down, it's kind of hard to make adjustments because everything comes down. It's hard to make adjustments to something that doesn't really exist, right? Like, like if you're already eating a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're already snacking a little bit, just switching those out is a lot easier than now having to not only start eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner more consistently, um, but also pick the ones that work the best, right? Like that's just not, that's, that's so many steps you're changing. And we know that's not sustainable. We have to start with small little baby things forever and always. Amen. (laughs) That's why I start with cars when it comes to mobility. Um, but tracking is going to be one of the best ways to figure out whether or not you're eating enough protein. Like that's just hands down. There's other ways to estimate it. Again, find a professional who can work with you or contact me. I'll help you find somebody. But um, tracking is going to tell you if you're eating enough and then you can slowly titrate that and add a little bit more. And I'll talk about some of the ways that I've done that and how I kind of approach that. But the last thing I want to know, want to uh, talk about in this podcast when it comes to like tracking and all of that is that um, there's a concept called intuitive eating and um, that whole world I'm not even going to get involved in or talk about, but I just want you to know that sometimes we can do intuitive eating, um, but our world that we live in, I've talked about this before, but it is not conducive it doesn't match our physiology. So the way that we work, the way that our brains work and the way that our body systems work are very much um, governed by a nervous system that is very like primitive. So um, we've just like evolved really quickly in our daily lives and our nervous system has not. And so there's a little bit of a mismatch. Um, So in a perfect world, yeah, we might be able to follow our hunger and, um, and full satiety signals a little bit better, but there are so many things in our world now that affect that, that it's not always something that we can go off of. Some of my clients will be like, well, I, I, I have to eat enough. I'm not, I'm not really hungry. I don't have that much of an appetite. A lot of our appetite, um, is affected by a lot of different things. Stress and anxiety can also affect and, and depression can affect our, um, appetite, just being busy can affect our appetite. The types of foods we eat can affect our appetite. There are so many things that we can't always govern and go off of our appetite. And then I also want to note that if you are an active person, our appetite's not always going to match our exercise. Sometimes we exercise and do a really intense exercise workout. We might get dehydrated or something like that we're not necessarily gonna be super hungry after that, right? So it's really important to know that our appetite doesn't always match the amount of food we need or how much food we need or not. So moving on, how do we get this amount of protein in, right? Um, Basically, the simplest thing you can think of is trying to get 30 to 40 grams per meal that you eat, right? If we eat three meals a day, 30 grams per meal would be 90 grams already. If we eat three meals a day and we're eating 40 grams in a meal, which is a lot, by the way, for a lot of people who aren't used to this, that's 120 grams of protein. That is kind of like what I try to aim for personally about at my minimum. So that is a way that you can, it's achievable, right? Um, 30 or 40 grams per meal seems like a lot. I'm going to kind of talk about this from a perspective as a woman in my perspective. Um, but I grew up, I don't really know where the message came from, but I didn't eat a lot and I was very conscious of how much food I would eat. And it feels like It was more like, I don't know, this weird concept that women just shouldn't eat as much, right? And once I got into realizing I wasn't eating as much as I needed to, I started paying more attention to that. And I was like, wow, I actually am like, there's these weird things around how much food I'm eating. Like, I feel like I'm eating a lot, right? Compared to other people. And comparison is something we naturally do as humans. And so I was starting to realize like what's on my plate versus Ryan um, versus other people. And I'm like, I'm eating so much. 
Um, so it's really important to notice that those things might happen to you as well. You might feel like it's a lot of food. We have a lot of fear around food as women. I totally recognize that. I know there's a lot of things to unpack there. If you feel like it's really significant, um, it might be worth seeking out a professional a counselor, a therapist who can kind of work through some of that with you. Um, but I do want to um, recognize that those feelings do happen and that can be a barrier for a lot of us um, because we're like, I don't know, that's just too much food, right? And we have this fear of gaining weight, getting bigger. That was mine personally, for sure, 100%. Um, a lot of body image struggles um, for me growing up. And so it's something that does get better and you get used to it and you start to realize how much better you feel. But there is... Um, there are some barriers there. So if that's happening to you, just know that it's normal. I would say it's not normal, but it's common. Um, it's not normal for us to be afraid of fueling ourselves. In fact, it's complete bullshit. Um, but it's common and you're not alone. And you just mean it may be a little sign that there's some things to work through there. And again, could be something worth um, going to therapy about and kind of adjusting if you're if you're going through this. Um, again, this is why it's helpful to work with a professional. So when you are going through that, just know that might come up because this might feel like a lot of food for you. Um, but sometimes we don't realize how much we're snacking or how much we're eating, or maybe we're just like eating like crap all week and under fueling our bodies. And then we like, uh, eat a lot during the weekends and maybe it's not the most nutrient dense foods, um, which still don't have enough protein. And that can be us eating a lot of calories, but over days um, when we're actually training really hard throughout the week, we're not eating enough. So that matters too. Um, it's not something that is typically recommended to just like not eat enough protein for like three days and then like double or triple consume your protein. Like you want it spread out throughout the day and you want every day to be hitting your protein. And that's the general recommendations. Um, so let's talk about what that kind of looks like and how I typically kind of approach something like that but I just wanted to let you know that it might feel like a lot. So 30 grams of protein seems like cool. I'll just get 30 grams three times a day. It's actually harder than it might sound. Um, so some options that I do for breakfast are obviously going to be, I love eggs and bacon. Um, I actually switched to Canadian bacon because it's a little bit lower in Canadian bacon is a little bit lower in calories, but it's just like mostly protein. Um, and I, I think it tastes better. It's also less sodium, which feels better for me. Um, so that's kind of something that I consistently do. I also eat uh, Dave's Killer Bread, I believe is what it's called, which is five grams of protein per slice. I have two slices of those. That's 10 um, grams of protein. And then like 10 grams or nine grams from like the Canadian bacon. So that's already 20 grams. And then two or three eggs is gonna be another 12 to 18 grams. That right there is 30 to 40 grams of protein for your breakfast. That's just one example. Um, but that's like a really consistent food for me. I love it, I don't get sick of it. I have my eggs like fried, sometimes scrambled. I put spinach in there sometimes. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, Greek yogurt is another great option. Know that when you start to increase your calories uh, for protein, um, you may want to pay attention to your other calories. So some people want more of the low fat just because they want more protein without all the extra calories. Um, fat's not something to be scared of, but like, again, you have to pick what works for you, but Greek yogurt's always a good option. I also will sometimes eat protein oatmeal when I'm like more quick. So I have regular oatmeal, quick oats, right? And then I just put a scoop of my protein in there. It's just vanilla, it's very, plain. It doesn't, it has a little bit of, of sweetness to it. I love cinnamon with it too. And like maybe some fruit, um, for some taste. And then the fruit is really helpful for like fiber, um, and those nutrients, but that's a really easy way of getting, um, my proteins, 24 grams of, or yeah, 24 grams per scoop of protein. I just buy it off of Amazon. I think I have like a, I buy the grass fed kind because, um, I personally do better when I'm eating more of the grass fed type of protein. Other protein doesn't do that well with my body. Um, but protein in your oatmeal, um, I've done protein in a bowl of cereal. So I literally will make my regular like milk and, or my protein shake with a little bit of water and I'll use that with cereal. And that works as well when my appetite's not very good. Um, those are some examples. Also breakfast food doesn't need to be breakfast food. So just an, you know, like you can eat anything for breakfast. Um, lunch, like 
I'm big in salads. Like I hate them right now personally because they take forever to eat um, and I'm annoyed by them. But um, I always will have like boiled eggs or chicken or tuna salad, something like that. But um, I have salads a lot. I recently shared on Instagram. I've been doing these Aldi bowls with like quinoa and other things that already have like 14 to 16 grams of protein in them and then I add more protein so I add more chicken um and things like that and tuna if I make tuna it already has usually 20 if you have like double the can you get 40 so one of the easiest ways we can add more protein is just get bigger serving sizes of the protein that we're eating so if you normally just put a little chicken in there maybe double it and so instead of 10 grams of chicken it's 20 um and then adding little things that also have protein in there so that might be some examples for lunch of course you could there's tons of examples but those are my typical um i often will have a snack that also has protein in it because my lunch will typically only have like a around 20 to 30 grams and I try to aim for that 40 bout so I might have a cheese stick or cottage cheese or Greek yogurt I might have a protein shake um that's very common if I didn't have protein in my oatmeal earlier that day I'll have a protein shake especially when I'm really consistent with my lifting um maybe a protein bar I really like the premier protein bars that are at Costco I think you can probably buy them anywhere um but they to me are the best tasting ones I've ever had and they don't destroy your jaw as much as some of the the ones like Quest bars which I can't stand anymore um and then dinner is just like a piece of meat with whatever so beef tuna salmon steak whatever you like that's kind of the way that I think of it so I plan my meals around my protein source and I think that's what a lot of uh humans don't I never did when I was growing up it was very much like oh I'm just gonna have like spaghetti and it's like where's the protein in the spaghetti unless you make meat sauce um or you have a meatball right or it's just like we think of meals instead of thinking about like what do I want this meal to consist of so it's little things like that but I would say one of the biggest ways for you to get the protein you need is just focusing on your protein in the meal right like that's what the meal needs to consist of is protein um now i eat meat there's different concepts i'm not somebody who's vegetarian or vegan if you are you actually need to take even more steps to make sure that you get the amount of protein you need and all of the amino acids you want to make sure that it you are eating complete protein um sources so you might need to work with a professional to make sure you're getting all the nutrients you need because meat has a lot of nutrients. And if you're not eating it, you need to get them from somewhere. And a lot of supplements are required for that. So if that's you, that's totally fine. Just make sure you're working with a professional to get all of those things um, because that there's a, a very an even higher risk for relative energy deficiency and stress fractures and all the things I mentioned at the beginning if you are not eating meat. So just know that when you're an active person. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of all I wanted to talk about protein. It's just making sure that we are paying attention to it really goes a long way. Um, and the idea of self-awareness and self-reflection is very important. Those are probably like the biggest skills that I could say for like changing any habit and like anything in general, they're huge for being able to make adjustments. You can't make adjustments if you don't know where you're starting from. I always say that. Like when you start tracking, it's important to understand, like look at your lifestyle, look at what your habits are. How can you slowly manipulate those to move the dial a little bit closer to where you want to be? That's literally what all health coaching is. So, and that's what a coach helps you do. So again, if you need a recommendation for a coach, reach out to me on Instagram, send me an email. I'm happy to help um, or look at Steph Godros. She's got some um, great information and a couple great programs that really help educate people and learn, like help them learn how to um, eat enough to support their activities. Um, and she goes far beyond protein, right? So she goes into carbs and things like that, which also a lot of um, women are under eating when they are active. So don't be afraid of food. Um, prioritize your protein. You might feel way better, get sick less, recover better and finally see progress in the gym. I wish that I learned this earlier. It's one of those things. It's why there's a whole podcast on this because holy cow, have I put on a ton of muscle mass and really um, surpassed some of my old strength plateaus from just getting a little bit more protein. And I'm way more motivated to get into the gym when I'm doing that. And it's pretty great. Um, doesn't take care of all motivation, but it, it is definitely something I, it's one of my first go-tos when I'm feeling like I'm really tired or I'm not focusing or I have brain fog or I'm low motivation, low energy to go to the gym. It's like, well, what's my protein been like lately? Do I need to start paying attention to it again? Um, and that's kind of like a, a, a never ending cycle. So, um, 
yeah, don't be afraid of food. Eat your protein. Um, don't be afraid of bigger serving sizes. Add protein in. Like, there's no law that says you can't have more than one protein source, by the way, as well. If you go out to eat or you're making food, um, you don't just have to have chicken. You can add eggs to your lunch salad, you know? Or, um, you know, you don't have to just have a salad. You can have cottage cheese with it. So a lot of those little things, edamame, I think, is also like a great way to add protein. There's a lot of little ways to add them in that um, really helps to get your protein up. A lot of people, when they first start, will kind of use all the snacks as ways to get more protein. But I'm telling you, one of the best things you can do is center your meal around a decent protein source. Um, find ones that you like, make them taste better, however you need to, but really um, center around that and and then try to get that extra 10 to 20 grams with a snack, a protein shake, or something along those lines. Um, that way you're getting more nutrient density rather than just all of the um, products that might not have as much nutrients in them. So I was very picky to start, so um, I would eat more of the protein shakes and protein cookies and protein whatever. And that's great if that's what you need to get started or it's temporary. I think I shared this a while back. There are times when I am just doing what I call those, I call those convenient protein, convenience protein options. I will go to those when my life gets busy because it's more important that I get my protein in and still eat enough um, than it is that I just like have healthier quote unquote meals. Um, but I always do that and know that it's temporary, right? So um, that is life. Things um, ebb and flow. There is one more thing. If you're listening to this still, as I'm like remembering the last thing I wanted to talk about, congratulations, because you're going to get a little uh, tidbit of information that's really helpful. Um, one of the other times protein is really important is post-surgery, especially if you're doing a surgery, really any surgery, but if we're talking about um, you're active and you are doing you get a surgery and you're not able to move or use that body part for a while. Um, if we're not eating enough protein to maintain or su support our muscle um, mass, we will actually atrophy our muscle a ton. When I had my knee surgery down on my ACL when I was 14, um, my leg lost so much muscle mass. It was so skinny. Um, I think my thigh was the size of my ankle. It was, I've never seen my thighs that small because I always was in gymnastics or soccer, which build are known to build really big um, thigh muscles. And I wonder what would have happened and how much less muscle mass I would have lost if I did uh, eat more. So we will definitely lose some muscle mass when you're not using it, but it will be extremely like expedited when we're not eating enough protein. Also, protein is really important for our immune system and the repair um, system. So all the repair that's going on after a surgery, it's going to be really important that we're having enough protein there. So your actual protein requirements do increase after surgery and after an injury. So pay attention to that just because you're not lifting. If you are somebody who is active and you are taking a break from lifting, you still want to keep your protein up um, because that is how we support and maintain our muscle mass, which is really important important if we are going through a phase of like not lifting we do want to maintain as much muscle mass as possible because as we age that's something that is kind of like a life hack if you will um for mitigating aging effects is muscle mass and we lose that very quickly the older we get if we are not working to maintain or add on muscle mass so even if you're not lifting you still want to eat protein right so okay now I'm officially done. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it was helpful, as always, I love to hear from you. Let me know. Um, if you want to learn more or need some help finding a coach, please reach out. I'm more than happy to send you in the right direction. Um, and if you love this episode and think somebody would benefit from listening to it, please send it their way. If you have not already given me a review, please go hit that five-star review real quick. Drop a note. It's really helpful. I appreciate it so much. It's the best way to support this content. Um, and with that being said, I will see you or I will chat with you in the next podcast. Mm -hmm.